I would like to start by thanking Aubrey, of course, and the Simons Foundation for having me. And I would also like to thank the thousands and thousands of people who de dedicate huge chunks of their life to sitting in a laboratory all day and crunching numbers to produce these wonderful pieces that fill the ocean of knowledge that one day will hopefully um, enable us to achieve longevity, scale, and velocity. <coughs> So if you, you've seen this chart a million times today, but if you if you make a comparison of the leading causes of death over the last decade. Sorry, just um, speak into the lectern, oh, please. Thanks. Sure. Okay. Um, so leading causes of death over the past decade, of course, external factors have gone down. Internal factors, which we attribute to biological aging, has gone up. I contend that many of the leading causes of death are not a biological aging problem, they're a, ph a phenotypic expression problem. So we, so 30 years of research, we know we have all of these, these signal, signals in our DNA, we have lots of programming that we know can shut down inflammation, can um, reverse and stop and reverse a lot of the primary diseases of premature death and aging, but a lot of our tinkering has resulted in false summits and pieces of the puzzle to be solved. So I propose that we take a step back and look at how um, a lot of this programming actually evolved to work. And there is no better place to do that um, than nuclear transcription factors. So if you're a molecular biologist or a biochemist, you know what nuclear transcription factors are for the rest of us. Um, these are, they basically sit in the membrane of the nucleus and they talk directly to the DNA. They, are, they act as the primary interface between our DNA and our external environments. So the foods we eat, the um, stresses we experience, the infections, every, every factor in your life funnels down to this one phenotypic, one interface of phenotypic expression. These can be, so NTFs can be manipulated from the inside or via sirtuins or from the ever-changing environment of the intracellular space. Um, we can influence these by um, just mimic, mimicking the conditions in which they evolve to function. So we can look at their intracellular conditions, heterodynamic partners, um, agonists and antagonists. So there's an ongoing dance between the two primary NTFs uh, that are involved in gene regulation of and by fatty acids. These are the PPARs, which are peroxisome proliferated activated receptors, um, which play an essential role in metabolic adaptation um, to fasting by inducing the genes for mitochondrial oxidative mitochondrial peroxisomal fatty acid oxidation. Basically, they allow you to burn fat as an energy source. Um, SREBP, sterile L regulatory elemental binding proteins. These are global regulators of lipid synthesis, including fatty acids, cholesterol, triglycerides. They also um, control the expression of the LDL receptor. SREBPs are much more ancient. Um, NTF, they're conserved from fungi to humans. And, um, and then what, you know, they allowed all of these organisms to repair themselves and grow. But the problem is chronic activation of SREBPs from overnutrition is associated with the various diseases, or various obesity-related diseases, including fatty liver, insulin resistance, and atherosclerosis. PPARs are one of the youngest NFTs. Um, they're ex observed exclusively in the metazoans, which are the multicellular um, creatures. Um, they basically um, allow us to use fat as an energy source. They basically let us take our lunch with us and eat it, eat it later. Mm. So hundreds of studies over the last 20 or 30 years have demonstrated the activation of the PPARs um, of the various isotypes. So it's incredible promise for arresting <coughs> and reversing the primary disease, disease etiologies that have become the leading causes of death of premature aging and death. Um, some of the benefits include downregulation of the inflammatory signaling, induce rapid fat loss, reverse fatty liver disease very quickly, um, prevent development and increase clearance of beta amyloid in the brain, 
induce detoxification of organic environmental pollutants by upregulation of peroxidase 1. They suppress growth of some types of tumors, specifically PPR gamma, um, acts as a tumor suppressor in the liver. Um, I'm going to go through, through these quickly because of time. Um, but we know that PPA activation of the very of one of the PPR isotypes decreases the inflammatory response in <clears throat> cardiovascular cells, and uh, particularly in endothelial cells. Also, attenuates pathogenesis of atherosclerosis. Um, we know that PPR raises levels of adiponectin, which resensitizes cells to insulin and has the ability to reverse type 2 diabetes. Um, with PPR and metabolic syndrome, um, when we use agonists for PPARs, we get a 30% reduction of fasting plasma triglycerides, 26% reduction of apolipoprotein B, which is very strong, um, strongly associated with atherosclerosis. 23% reduction in LDL cholesterol, 11% in insulin, 20% reduction of fat in the liver. Um, with Alzheimer's disease, PPR activation actually acts in two ways. So one, it prevents the, the inflammation and accumulation of beta amyloid plaque in the brain. But it also enhances phagocytosis of the deposited forms of beta amyloid. Um, which has been demonstrated to actually reverse the contextual memory deficits that were observed. Okay. Um, we also know that PPARs um, repress transcriptional activity of NF kappa B. And so, anyone who um, read Dong Shen Tsai's paper and his presentation from Tuesday, I'm sure most people are interested in getting NF kappa B to kind of calm down to slow aging. So with this information, you're thinking, okay, well, PPARs are good, SRABPs are bad. Um, SRABPs are not all bad because they, they actually allow us to repair our cell membranes, they um, allow us to endocytize antioxidants that protect us from um, like oxidized cholesterol or creating oxidized cholesterol. Um, so really, the answer here is SRABPs are not so bad, but overexpression of SRABPs are super bad. Um, so, so what has happened, we actually, 20 years ago, we, we developed um, a class of drug called the TZDs, which we know activate PPAR, but all of the diseases that this is supposed to treat and this incredible promise, we didn't really see a lot of good outcomes. And, um, Really, what we've seen <laughs> is the advent of food cultivation and cooking that began 10,000 years ago has led us to one grand culmination of overexpression of SRABPs that has manifested as the phenotype of many of today's leading causes of death. But there is a way to manipulate these, these things. Um, so if we look at the agonists and antagonists for PPARs and SRABPs, they're diametrically opposed. And this offers one of the insights as to why some of these drugs didn't work so well, because your system is just not designed to you know, activate PPARs, which we'll see what the agonists are in a second, um, and then have conditions that are constantly activating SRADPs. They're, they're designed to have one functioning or the other with a very small crossover point. So the agonists for SRADPs are Guess what they are? Insulin, glucose, and to a lesser degree, saturated fats. PPAR agonists are a lot of these fat based ones, so arachidonic acid from animal fat, um, dietary polyunsaturated fatty acids, DHA from fish, and this great protein liver fatty acid binding protein which transports lipids in the blood. And then we have all these other agonists that we, we like to take to think that we're reversing our aging, right? So we have curcumin, poly Phenols from pomegranate, resveratrol, which works via surges of one, alpha lipoic acid in the liver, um, the Chinese herbs, astragalus and kudzu, and the TZDs that I mentioned earlier. And the best one of all, <laughs> isoquinones, <laughs> which um, come from beer. Now, unfortunately, alcohol will actually um, downregulate the expression of PPAR. Um, so I'm kind of hoping if you drink really hoppy beer, maybe that'll kind of offset it a little bit. It's working so far. Um, 
<laughs> so, so two of the problems here, this is a minor one, PPAR and SRIBPs share common obligate heterodynamic, heterodimer partners, so RXR and VDR. Um, they share it with other things too, but if you have one that's upregulated, even if you're adding agonists, it's going to be interfering with the ability of the other one to function. <laughs> Um, the big rate limiting factor here is um, fibroblast growth factor 21. This one, up, they're actually doing good experiments with this right now with the injections. Um, it upregulates PPR and downregulates SRABPs. Yay! Um, but to get this to work on a physiological level, um, FGF21 is, is induced by ketone bodies, the ketone body acetoacetate and HMG-CS2, and you don't really see a prominence of these in a physiologic, in the body, until you severely restrict um, carbohydrates and like, <coughs> insulin. Um, there are literally people walking around, um, you know, you see mothers put coke in baby bottles. I think we have a whole society walking around who probably has never had one of their PPAR um, NTFs working since they were in utero. Um, so ultimately, if you look at how all these things work, the evidence ultimately suggests that most, the most effective way to safely manipulate SRABPs and PPARs is to mimic the physiologic conditions in which they evolved. And we've, we have several um, whole societies who um, are alive because of this, um, of, because of PPAR functioning and who survived many months out of the year on a ketogenic diet. One is Mongolia, um, another one is the Inuit. And then we also know that um, for 30 years we've used a ketogenic diet to treat epilepsy. We know that it reduces the frequency and severity of seizures. Nobody quite understands why. I suspect it has to do with a lot of the inflammation that's calmed down by PPAR. Um, so there are very few studies done on the ketogenic diet. Um, Rosalind Anderson, who you saw us um, speak on Tuesday, um, completed one this year, and she'll be um, publishing later. But what she said was consistent with what they found here. Um, they, they saw um, a very similar pattern to caloric restriction. Um, and these, in, in the experiments, they basically fed mice a high-fat diet, ketogenic diet, and regular diet, all same calories. <coughs> So the ones on the ketogenic diet failed to gain weight despite high caloric density yeah. of their we diet. We need to come to the conclusion, I'm afraid. We need to come to the conclusion, I'm afraid. Oh, closer to the, okay. Um, increased energy expenditure, um, transiently lost weight and then stabilized at a lower weight. Um, insulin levels were extremely low compared to both animals fed chow and animals fed um, high fat diet and then um, Despite the consumption of saturated fat, serum lipids did not increase. Um, we also know that the ketogenic diet, that once you introduce ketones to the brain, um, it reduces um, TNF alpha and um, trend and and NF kappa B. And so, in conclusion, the ketogenic diet can be used as a tool to activate. PPAR and reverse the phenotypic expression that is manifested as many of the leading causes of aging and premature death in the industrialized world. Thank you.